Uh, we want to welcome everyone. This program is hosted by the Biopharma Research Council. We are an association for scientists across all the many silos of biomedical research, industry, academia, nonprofit, government, and suppliers. And we do educational programs through webinars and conferences and roundtables throughout the year. Uh, these are our various uh, social media outlets, and uh, we really want to welcome you for being here. Our purpose is to introduce scientists to each other across all the different communities. So we'll look at any disease, any technology. We think that the most important thing that we can provide is environments for people to learn from each other. There may be a solution that was developed in another uh, part of the community that would be very, very valuable to you. Uh, I like this. This is from a conference we did last year. That's Bob Boland from Janssen Pharmaceuticals. Uh, we have a couple of webinars coming up. We have the, we're doing a short course in the microbiome. Tomorrow, Rob Knight will present on spatially explicit maps. That's 11 o'clock Eastern Daylight Time tomorrow. Um, and uh, note that picture of Winston Quo. I'm going to tell you more about him in a moment. Uh, both Winston and Howard are members, and Howard, Dr. Howard Young are uh, members of our scientific advisory board. And then on the 30th, um, the uh, topic here is going to be the impact of my, the microbiome on uh, cancer therapy. So the 30th is going to be uh, uh, Romina Goldschmidt and Lee Greathouse. Uh, in May, we're doing a conference in Boston on genome engineering and a look at CRISPR and other technologies. Uh, I'm very excited about this one, the Internet of Medical Things about cybersecurity, which is something that we really need to address throughout all different aspects of biomedical research today. That's my email address. If you're interested in getting involved, feel free to send me a note. I'd love to invite you to join the planning committee for that. This is just a small selection of some of the organizations and companies that have given us support over the years. Just like to acknowledge that it's a very supportive community. Uh, you can put questions into the box at the side of your screen anytime, and uh, we'll address them at the end of the talk. But uh, if you're having any issues, certainly uh, feel free to enter them there. We'll do what we can to help you. So I'm going to introduce to you um, your uh, two speakers today. We're first going to hear from Winston Kuo. Dr. Kuo is the founder of the Harvard Medical School's Laboratory for Innovative Translational Technologies, part of the Clinical and Translational Science Award program. His clinical and translational initiatives have expanded globally in developing countries such as Brazil, China, Mongolia, Nigeria, Saudi Arabia, Saudi Arabia and South Africa, focusing upon accelerating understanding of mechanisms that affect human disease, catalyzing the identification and development of useful biomarkers, and speeding the development of therapeutics in patients. In addition to being COO of EIS Diagnostics, he is founder and editor-in-chief of the Journal of Circulating Biomarkers and Nanobiomedicine, a separate publication. He has consulted with the NIH on interdisciplinary outreach and sits on a number of business and nonprofit scientific advisory boards, including the Biopharma Research Council. He received his Doctor of Medical Sciences, Oral and Computational Biology, from Harvard Medical School. Uh, Dr. Pardi Sabeti, uh, our primary speaker today, is a computational geneticist with expertise developing algorithms to detect genetic signatures of adaption in humans and the microbial organisms, organisms that affect, infect humans. Her lab's key research areas include developing analytical methods to detect and investigate evolution in the genomes of humans and other species, examining host and viral genetic factors driving disease susceptibility to the devastating and deadly disease widespread in West Africa, Lassa hemorrhagic fever virus, and in investigating the genomes of microbes, including specific Lassa, Ebola, malaria, cholera and tuberculosis uh, microbes to help in the development of interventional strategies. Dr. Quo. Thanks, Joanne. Um, as Joanne stated, uh, we're so delighted and an honor to have Dr. Pradeesa to discuss her recent work 
with uh, respect to the Ebola outbreak. I'd just like to highlight some of her, her, her proactiveness in utilizing state-of-the-art technologies to sort of document um, the viral diversity and evolution and provide the data actually to the public, uh, which def therefore has sort of accelerated, for example, the team at Scripps Research Institute to map the sequences to those antibodies on the experimental uh, Ebola drug ZMAP. So some of the lessons learned from the global community effort in, in, in reference to some of the Dr. Pardee Sabidi's effort, now that the Ebola crisis in sort of West Africa appears to sort of be petering out, um, and this week uh, President Obama called for uh, renewed international efforts to sort of rebuild uh, the health systems in Liberia, uh, Guinea, and Sierra Leone, and to sort sort of uh, you know show up uh, the response to future pandemics in that region. And also this week, uh, Secretary of State uh, uh, John Kerry also signed an agreement on this Monday, actually, to sort of establish this new CDC and prevention in Africa to be launched sometime this year. So now with infections down to around three dozen a week across these three affected countries, uh, investigators globally are focused now on this new uh, uh, incident of two women who just passed away this month and, uh, and due to possible sexual transmission. Hence the CDC uh, and, and you know, the World Health Organization have uh, issued uh, guidelines in terms of uh, Ebola transmissions. So in addition, you know, uh, the, the, the it's, un, it's not unusual for viruses to change for a period of time. You know, Ebola is an RNA virus, just like uh, HIV and influenza, uh, which do have a high rate of mutation. Um, and this is where we will hear a lot more in detail from Dr. Pardis's uh, talk when discussing the genomic surveillance of the West African Ebola outbreak over the 2014-15 time period. Here you go, Dr. Pardis Abidi. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, sorry about that. I thought I had, and then it didn't click on. I apologize. I um, I was just uh, explaining that I'm going to be um, so that I wanted to thank Winston, thank Joanne, and thank everybody online and everybody um, organizing this. I'm very excited to speak to you today about my work studying evolutionary forces in humans and pathogens. Um, and I'm going to start with giving you some background of how I came to even begin uh, pursuing this work. One second, um, and giving you just an example of how we can leverage evolution to find human biology. And it'll start all the way back with Darwin and Wallace. The idea that in the, in the 19th century, these uh, two sort of laid forth the idea of natural selection, um, which uh, began the conversation that soon um, got many individuals to understand that not just organisms on Earth, but other, uh, but humans themselves may be evolving. Um, but it wasn't until about, uh, until the mid-20th century where we had an example of human evolution. That's actually when Haldane made an observation of the natural world. Um, he noted that there are many red blood cell disorders um, and that these seem to occur in regions of the world where malaria was endemic. Um, and he, given that malaria infects red blood cells, he hypothesized that these red blood cell disorders like sickle cell anemia may have become common because they conferred resistance to malaria um, through evolution. And just a few years later, oops, A.C. Allison bore out that hypothesis when he showed that the correlation that malaria and red blood cell disorders like sickle cell anemia correlate geographically and that individuals who carry um, the sickle cell trait are protected from malaria. And this is just a powerful and simple observation that began with Haldane um, and that bore out this evidence of uh, our evolution and got to human biology. And so I've always been fascinated by this way that evolution can tell us about what is important um, in our biology, what is important to the genome. And my research pursuit over the last uh, almost now, almost 20 years, almost two decades, has been to systematically interrogate human biology through evolution. Um, and so I'll, I'll sort of talk about two different areas that my lab works in. One is identifying adaptive traits in humans, and the other one is interrogating the genomes of deadly viruses. And this is really because the first is sort of, you'll see, we'll, we'll go on a little bit of a journey first, but you'll see how critical it is, these kinds of approaches, to getting to the second area. Um, so let's just start with a signal of recent positive natural selection. So um, I focus on positive, uh, recent positive natural selection. That's sort of beneficial adaptive traits that have emerged, say, within the last 10 to 50,000 years in human populations. And when that happens, if you, if you see here a cartoon of a set of individuals in a population, and if an individual has an adaptive trait that's something that 
enhances their survival or their reproductive success, they'll more likely survive, pass that trait on to their children, their children's children, and that new allele under positive selection will rise rapidly in prevalence in the population. And looking backwards from today, we would say that a signal of a positively selected allele is an allele that has a high prevalence but a young age. And so trying to understand that age is important and that signal can be seen in the genome. So this is, for most variants that have become common in the population, they've been around for a long time. And over that time, recombination and mutation has reshuffled the background on which that mutation lies. So you'll see them on many different backgrounds. We call this many different haplotypes or a broken haplotype. Where if we look to the left and to the right of that mutation, we'll see a lot of diversity. But if a new mutation emerges and spreads in a very short period of time, it'll take with it a, a, a section of the genome around it because recombination won't have that time to reshuffle the background. We call that a long haplotype. And so in my early career, I developed ways of identifying signals like this long haplotype in the genome and applying it to new data emerging from a variation across human populations and was able to find hundreds of regions of adaptive evolution in the genome, including ones that we had seen before, the handful of variants we knew about, like malaria and sickle cell, but also pigmentation and lactose tolerance. But there are hundreds more, and we didn't know what they do. Um, and the challenge really there is because this idea of this long haplotype, the fact that this very rapid rise in prevalence of the mutation drags with it a whole segment of the genome, makes it so it's very challenging to find out where the signal comes from. And so, in the next part of my work, as I established my lab, I began to investigate different ways of kind of pinpointing within these huge regions, which could be megabase long, what's the mutation driving evolution and what's important for our biology. And so I started to look at other statistics that have been developed. I had worked a lot on the long haplotype, but there are other ways that we could look at evidence of natural selection. For example, um, the t one that's listed as two here, differences in populations, that's a picture of uh, the prevalence of a gene uh, in the Duffy locus that confers resistance to Plasmodium vivax malaria. And you can see that the mutation um, has gotten to about 100% in some parts of Africa, but is absent elsewhere in the world. And this is suggestive that, that vivax malaria was an ancient uh, pressure that drove up this resistance. And we can see these other types of signals in the genome. Each of them have their own distinct advantages and disadvantages. But I began to realize that the selected variant itself should carry all of these different signals because it's the one driving these different signals. So I wondered if we could use the combined power of different signals of selection to localize an adaptive variant. And I went ahead and did that. I just want to show you, I won't go into the, the, the algorithm too much, but I'll just give you some example of what it looks like. This um, composite of multiple signals, or CMS, increased the mapping resolution of up to 100-fold of regions that we're looking at. These are these large uh, signals that we see due to these long haplotypes and other signals, large footprints in the genome of evolution. When we localize in and we use CMS, we can actually really clean up the signal a lot. And we can see that in this megabase long region, the signal really focuses right over this pigmentation gene that's, uh, and this mutation of the pigmentation gene important in skin color. And we basically took the handful of other variants and showed that over and over again we could get much, much better at finding out what's the selected variant and begin to get to the biology that's important. And here's just some of the other signals that we looked at where they're original, these like large regions of the genome that seemed interesting. And then as we developed our statistic, we could get to these individual loci and attractable set of variants that we could pursue. And when we started to look, we found all sorts of things that were driving evolution that we didn't know about before. These hundreds of signals started to tease out stories of our evolution, such as ones that are important in thermoregulation, the sort of regulation of heat in, in uh, humid environments, ones that are important in metabolism, fat metabolism, leucine metabolism. But the ones I became most interested in are the ones important in infectious disease, um, like a mutation in toll-like receptor 5 that changes immune response to flagella, or like uh, mutations that we found under selection in Bangladesh associated with resistance to cholera. The one that I spent the better part of the last seven years pursuing is one of the strongest signals of selection that we found in West Africa uh, um, in the gene large, which is linked to resistance to a, a disease called Lassa fever. And so here's the signal of selection that we found in the Yoruba population of Nigeria, so an ethnic group in Nigeria, in West Africa, that localized to the gene large, and here's the signal coming in. Well, as I started to learn more about what the gene does, 
I found the largest critical for the entry of Lassa virus, which is the deadly virus first discovered in Nigeria where we found the signal of selection, so that was intriguing to us. And Lassa virus actually causes a hemorrhagic fever, a deadly fever, a uh, febrile virus like Ebola with very high fatality rates. So all of this started to say, well, maybe natural selection was driving resistance to Lassa virus. But there is an issue. Lassa fever is actually described as an emerging disease. It was first discovered in Nigeria in 1969. Um, and it's essentially, and it's often considered either new or sort of rare in the, in the population. And so it led me to two driving questions. If Lassa fever is an emerging disease, then how could it have driven historical natural selection? My hypothesis was that it might not have been. It might have been an ancient and widespread disease. And the other question is, did this large variant rise to high prevalence by convergence to Lassa fever? Is this an instance of evolution driving resistance to an infectious disease? And the hypothesis would be that if it is, it is and if so, that the long haplotype, that signal selection we found at large, and the adaptive variant that underlies it, would be at lower prevalence in patients with Lassa fever due to the protection it confers. So we set out to pursue this hypothesis by establishing capacity to study a biosafety level 4 microbe in West Africa. And this is, there's a lot of challenges to this. We're talking about an emerging disease, biosafety level 4 virus, an RNA virus, which is sort of highly unstable and hard to work with, that we're studying in remote regions of the world. And so we developed research centers in Nigeria and Sierra Leone to pursue this. And we also developed a training program and a training exchange with the United States. Here are 11 of our collaborators from Nigeria and Senegal uh, last summer working in the labs. And as we began to investigate, we found a few things that were interesting. We found that it seems as if many cases of Lassa fever are going undetected in West Africa. This is a deadly biosafety level 4 virus that should raise alarm bells, but individuals are going undetected all the time because we're mostly looking for cases like this, and not only looking for cases like this, having to be there to detect them. But actually, most of the cases come in looking like this. They come in walking in with some conjunctivitis and other sort of mild symptoms, but malaise and fever, things that could be misdiagnosed as malaria or typhoid or a host of other things. And so it's very likely that without diagnostic tools in place, we may be missing many, many cases of this deadly virus. Seroprevalence studies in the literature and ones that our group and our collaborators have performed since show that there's likely widespread exposure to Lassa virus as well. If you look at this map of West Africa in Nigeria, uh, Sierra Leone, Liberia, and Guinea, you see high exposure rates. You know, in, in instances, about 20% of the population, millions of individuals that seem to have been exposed to this virus that we call an emerging virus. So this is sort of paradoxical. We also see that we have analyzed the viral genome. We began to sequence the over 200 um, uh, genomes of the Lassa virus itself that is likely an ancient virus that at a very minimum, based on just the sequences we have, it's over a thousand years old in Nigeria where we find the signal selection and likely much more older. And so this all starts to point us to the fact that this is an ancient and, and likely widespread disease that is going undetected and that could it could be a driver of evolution. Interestingly in Sierra Leone, the other uh, place that we studied, the virus, which is in blue here, um, uh, in, the in the lower right-hand corner, um, see, it appears much younger. It appears to only have emerged within the last 100, 150 years. Uh, and in that instance, we wouldn't expect to see selection acting on such a short time frame, but we might see it in Nigeria, particularly if it's older than the 1,000 years that we get from our sequences alone. And as we begin to study the human genetic side, we see these parallels. We found that long haplotype, um, that we found in, your, in the Yoruba, the signal of natural selection, in other populations, but at much lower frequencies. And so here are the signals of selection we see in the genome. In Yoruba, we see a strong signal of selection. In Ishan, we see that signal, and we see the long haplotype. Ishan is a population in Nigeria that has more susceptibility to Lassa virus than we see. We see the more many cases coming in. But there is resistance that appears to be occurring, and we do see that long haplotype, but just at lower frequency. And then when we look in the Sierra Leone population, where the virus likely emerged recently, we see that no signal of selection, and we see that the haplotype is there, maybe due to migration, but at a very low frequency. So focusing in on the Nigerian population, where we have the low frequency of the, of the large haplotype, but we also see these cases of loss of fever, we can begin to investigate. And uh, here we see the large selected allele is actually twofold less represented in the cases. So in a small cohort of cases that we've established so far, we already have a significant p-value looking, testing that hypothesis with an odds ratio of 0.51, uh, 52. And so that begins to tell us 
that it does appear that this long haplotype at large is at lower prevalence in lassa fever patients, possibly or likely due to protect the protection it confers. And so this was very, very intriguing to us, and we're pursuing this very, very um, hard, but in the midst of all of this, the Ebola outbreak hit West Africa. And because of the many years that we've been in, our, in the sites in Sierra Leone and Nigeria, in um, seven years in both sites for us and our, with our collaborators from Tulane, they've been there for over a decade in Sierra Leone establishing um, uh, outstanding facilities there. And so when this outbreak hit in West Africa and the fact that we work on hemorrhagic fevers, we were really the most uh, well positioned to begin to do work, but we were also worried about our staff that are working with us there. And so as soon as the outbreak hit in March, we are, uh, my uh, members of my lab flew out to West Africa and helped establish um, surveillance. In the, in, within four days, we were sort of out into West Africa. Within a few weeks, we already had diagnostics established in both Sierra Leone and in Nigeria. And the kinds of things we did is we brought supplies, many, many supplies. We, with our collaborators from Tulane and, and others, continue to bring supplies to the sites. We enhanced our containment and biosafety to be able to deal with these specimens um, safely. And we brought a number of diagnostics out, including the published ones from the published literature and ones we des designed to be more closely matched to the virus that was circulating. Um, and with, on May 25th, Augustine Goba, the director of the lab that we uh, work with at Kenema Government Hospital and one of our um, uh, cl close partners, diagnosed the first case of Ebola in Sierra Leone. We, that individual was treated at the hospital, diagnosed immediately, and nobody was infected and the individual recovered. It was an outstanding example of what diagnostics can do if they were performed at the site. Unfortunately, that patient came from hours away and was not the first case within this outbreak, might not have been even the first case within Sierra Leone. Um, in fact, by the time it hit uh, Sierra Leone in May, it had been circulating uh, you know, possibly as early as December in Guinea, um, outbreak declared in March, already hundreds of cases in Liberia by, you know, in, in within April and early May. And then when it came in, it came in like a tsunami, already eclipsed, um, you know, much bigger than many of the uh, outbreaks that had ever happened before, the largest outbreak at that point, and now really eclipsing um, the entire uh, outbreaks of the past. And when the outreach team from the hospital went to go and investigate the first case, as they do, it was about three, four hours away from the site, they found that it wasn't just a single case that they were tracking. There were already 14 people who t ended up testing positive for Ebola, 35 other suspected cases they collected, and, uh, and began to do incredible surveillance. But already the number of cases was escalating. Um, we immediately sent those samples as soon as they were diagnosed to the United States, where we began to prepare ourselves to do sequencing and to test these. We took the, those samples, um, um, but some of them had multiple uh, samples per um, individual patient, and within two days we extracted everything. Within five days we tested three different technologies. In the end we tested five different technologies and some of the samples were sequenced six different times to essentially figure out how would we do this best if needed. We had the data coming off of um, the machines, uh, Lumina machines within a day, and then we spent time really assembling de novo to figure out what we would have found in the data. We found 15 full-length sequences from a number of samples, and we identified 10 different things that were in the individuals who were negative that were causing disease. Importantly, we found that the positive individuals all had uh, copies of the virus in their blood, um, and that the negative individuals, none of them did. And so this was important to show that the diagnostics were also sensitive and specific. We then immediately, uh, and it, unfortunately the cases continued to escalate. Within weeks we had 100 cases coming in. We sent the samples, we were able to get 99 full-length genomes from 78 different patients, um, and we immediately really set data. We got it from 2000X coverage, which allows us to get really deep information about what virus is circulating. And we did, uh, it was very important to us that we um, recognize this was a very, very urgent situation, and we released the data as soon as it came off the machines and was curated and cleaned. Um, and that was very important to us to share with the community, but and we ourselves could begin to investigate the mutation evolution in near real time. We could see, this is basically, to orient you, this is a picture at the top of the Ebola genome with its seven different genes, and across it we see the 78 different individual patients from Sierra Leone, as well as three individual patients from Guinea, each row is an individual. We found that the 
that there are three different clusters that seem to have emerged of the virus in Sierra Leone, including one that was most close to the Guinean isolates and then ones that had mutated away from it. We were surprised that by the time the outbreak hit uh, in Sierra Leone, in that, in those 14 individuals, they were already circulating two distinct clusters of the virus that seemed to have separate from each other uh, months before. And so later we realized as this, this is the only thing that didn't fit with the epidemiology of this single point entrance. And we found that later there may have been cases that were known about but were not reported uh, within the country and that were not there for us to be able to do diagnosis of. But we and also begin to be able to really understand the transmissions. And what we find here is this is a picture of the phylogenetic tree of the viruses starting from the ones in Guinea and then the ones in Sierra Leone. We see that they're all very linked within, uh, you know, within a very short time frame, within that year. Um, if you do dating on the uh, analysis, it does appear that the um, strains from Guinea separate from each other around somewhere between January um, and uh, March and that the strains from Sierra Leone came from that, those branches and separated within uh, sort of uh, April and May likely. And so that begins to show us that this is likely a single uh, event, a single outbreak strain that is transmitting through human to human transmissions through many individuals and we can see these different clusters that are forming that tell us about the relationships between individuals infected. We also can trace temporal and geographical patterns. These are the first cases that you see um, on the left, you, the cases that you see coming in around the May 25th date. You see the two distinct clusters that were picked, captured at that, at that funeral event. And then you begin to see that, interestingly, the cluster that's most closely related to Sierra Leone disappears quite quickly. Um, but then uh, this cluster 2 that emerged with these sev several mutations that separate it suddenly appear and another mutation occurs on that background that creates what we call cluster 3. And you can see that the, that the cluster 3 has expanded very rapidly and taken over the population and now in Sierra Leone we've released another 150 genomes and they all now appear to be cluster 3. So we're seeing these waves of the virus changing. We can also see geographical patterns and if you look here at the map of Sierra Leone you see that distinct regions of Sierra Leone have very distinct clusters that are circulating. Um, and we can actually look much more closely. One thing is that we had 2000x coverage and so we could actually begin to see very close instances of high resolution who's, who's infecting whom. And we see one instance that we show here where a healthcare worker A for which we don't have a sample we know was treated by a healthcare worker B as well as a, uh, driven by a driver. And within those individuals, a new mutation emerged at low frequency um, that helps us see kind of these instances. And we see actually that the driver picked up this mutation and then drove to Jawi, where we see an explosion of cluster 3 that's defined by this mutation. And so we can see these instances of a single transmitted event that will change the uh, what's going on. And of course, the most important thing for urgent response is the effect of these mutations on diagnostics, vaccines, and therapies. If we have any chance to um, overcome this virus, it's using knowledge, using our ability to sequence it in real time to find out what it's doing and to stay on top of it. So we release this data so we can give access to the individuals developing these things uh, that all depend on the genome sequence of the virus. We released another, we rapidly released another 96 genomes, 51 in, in um, uh, December for another 45 in January. We've now released another 100, uh, 150 new genomes. We also have sample data from 278 samples. Many of these samples had to, for various reasons, uh, remain in Sierra Leone for, for months. We weren't able to follow the same very rapid process we had in place because of coordination with lots of partners. So there was some degradation. So we were only able to get 100 full-length genomes, but we made that available immediately. We've also established in-country genomic surveillance to make sure that these countries themselves can begin to do uh, sequencing analysis, sh shortening that time even more by having it there right at the field. And so this is our lab in Nigeria where you can see the Illumina machine and it's already in place, it's already generating sequence. This is our lab there with support from USAID and Illumina as well as a long-term support from the NIH and World Bank, we're able to establish these centers. Right now in Nigeria and in Senegal, we're um, doing sequencing of Ebola virus and we'll soon be establishing it in Sierra Leone. And uh, throughout this, we've really been developing and sharing genomic tools. This is a picture of individuals from the Institute Pasteur and, and CDC visiting us we used to do sequencing. We also made all of, that, uh, all of our protocols available online uh, 
uh, immediately so that individuals could begin to do sequencing themselves. We've made all of our tools for viral analysis and assembly uh, available on GitHub, on DNA Nexus, um, in collaboration with DNA Nexus. We've done data visualization statistics and created tools to make individuals able to analyze clinical data that we've also made available. And in, this is all really in line with our idea that we need for rapid data sharing and epidemics. This is a op-ed piece that we wrote um, in uh, Nature recently saying that we really need to make outbreak research open access. And on the right side you see this issue that there are these huge gaps in the data. Uh, all the sequence there you see 251 of the 266 genomes that were released in the first year of the outbreak were released by our group and we are just a small operation um, uh, doing the sequencing. We could do much, much better. We have, uh, and if you look Below, you'll see the peak cases within the thousands. That's that you know below is uh, thousands of cases emerging, and just at the time when we had the most cases, it's when the data basically went dark, where we had no idea what the virus was doing. We can do better. We can do better in making our sequencing uh, rapidly moving to sequencing and making that data available. Um, and so we're just trying to do our best to practice what we preach by always releasing our data as we develop it. And with the, in the last minutes, I just want to sort of say where we kind of come back to. One of the things, this idea that you know came to us, that Lassa fever was actually ancient and widespread, was just going undetected, made us really think of a more global phenomenon, which is, are we really talking about emerging diseases, or are we talking about emerging diagnosis of diseases that are circulating? We just don't have the tools to detect them. And we had actually published in 2012 that if we do recognize that some of these viruses are actually here, we could study them now and help the local communities and also head off a possible global pandemic. Of course, we were just not quite uh, far enough ahead, and so as we started to work on this, we were already um, this was already something that was going to become a concern. But one of the things that we proposed in this paper when we wrote it was that we had actually originally gone to Sierra Leone and to Nigeria to do research studies to really study the genetics of Lassa uh, virus. But in doing so, we had to move out from our international collaborative sites into the field allowing, creating diagnostics to begin to study the virus in the field. And as we did that, we actually were able to empower the local physicians, engage the communities, because now suddenly they had diagnosis and treatment for a virus that was affecting those populations. And what happened is with that kind of engagement that we got, more and more individuals began to come to the hospital and we started to collect many, many samples from individuals that had what we call undiagnosed acute febrile illness. And rather than stop there and just focus on loss of virus or just sequence the virus for research, we said let's sequence the viruses, to sequence the samples to figure out what else is circulating, and let's refine the diagnostics to include to incorporate, um, continue to incorporate new things that we identify. And in doing this, we create a positive feedback loop and have a great public health impact because we can really partner with different individuals towards public health as well as global surveillance. And so we had developed the, um, so we kind of took those ideas and developed a proposal defined as the African Center of Excellence for Genomics of Infectious Disease. And with NIH and World Bank fun funding, we launched these programs uh, with collaborators from Sierra Leone, Nigeria, and Senegal. And here we are all together on the steps um, of Redeemers University in Nigeria launching this program. Um, and with that, um, you know, one of the things that's important is we actually launched this program um, uh, in, uh, five, you know, the official launch was in May of last year, but within weeks, Dr. Khan, who's the incredible smiling person in the, right in the middle of that photo, was back in Sierra Leone where he was uh, uh, at the front and center of the Ebola outbreak that hit the country, and in July he passed from Ebola. And this reminds us of how important this is, how, you know, how fundamental this is to these communities that we need to develop capacity in Africa, we need to focus on our standing partners there, and we need to prepare them uh, because they are the great hope. They are heroes, all of whom could work anywhere in the world but choose to stay in their countries and to lead the efforts there, and we are committed over the long term to support them. And with that, I just want to thank my own lab um, at Harvard and the Broad Institute, the individuals who worked so, so hard with great um, love uh, within this outbreak. The individuals from Redeemers University and the Nigeria MOH that partnered with us to do uh, work in those countries and develop uh, ACEGID. The Aru Specialist Teaching Hospital where we work on loss of virus, where we study these individuals that um, are resistant to loss of virus and those that are infected. 
the Kenva Government Hospital, we, where we've been working on loss of virus, and that was one of the central points in the Ebola outbreak. Czech Entity University in Senegal are other partners that we've worked with for decades in malaria and are now partnering more globally. Tulane University and the Viral Hemorrhagic Fever Consortium. USAMR, the NIH, and NBAC are biosafety level four partners that make this work possible. And the entire Harvard HMS and Burke community. Um, and finally, just thanking the many different organizations that support the work that we do and this, inner, this spirit of international collaboration that makes this all possible. Um, and finally, finally, thank you for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you, Pardis. That's pretty amazing impact there. We have a few questions that I will share with you, and I encourage everyone to use the um, box on the right of your screen to add uh, any thoughts you have you'd like to share. Um, I, this came in when you were looking at slide number 25. The person was asking if it was possible to use your cursor to point out the data. I think there was a lot of lot going on there. If you'd like to go back and sure. just go a little bit more into. Sure. Slide 25, yep. It's a big um, one, right? So slide 25, <laughs> yep. Yeah. Um, sure. And so, uh, you know, one of the things I wanted to convey is this idea that the Sequencing data is so valuable, it has so much rich information, uh, particularly when we tie it to very good epidemiological data. And so here we're saying that we can actually begin to uh, look at the sequence data with different kinds of things like just temporal data, like just times of, um, of individuals coming into the hospital or times where they know that they've been infected or locations where the cases come from. We can begin to understand how this virus is moving between locations over time. And so here, basically, you can see, can you see my cursor here now then? Yes, we can. Here's the May 25th. These are the 14 cases that came in around that funeral event. So the first case came in, and then we went to look at all the other cases. And so this is the time of diagnostic in the hospital. And so this is all within days, but they may have been affected at the same time. And when we look at this, we see these two different clusters of the virus that emerged. We call it cluster one, which is the most one that's most closely related to Guinea in cluster two, um, where there are a number of cases there. But it was basically at that funeral event, they were pretty evenly split. There are individuals from both clusters, so likely two infection points that were happening. And again, we were trying to figure out why there was one event in two different versions of the virus, but it may well have been that something was percolating before. We now understand. And so here's these two different clusters, but we can see actually that cluster one somehow did not catch in, in Sierra Leone. It disappeared, and cluster two actually took over. And on the backbone of cluster two, this dark cluster, cluster three, a single mutation that happened in that healthcare worker A that infected healthcare worker B, and the driver from Dawi emerged and allows us to track what happened after. And so you can see actually that now by the time we get to June 16th, cluster one is gone, cluster three has been really taken over quite a bit, um, and cluster two is still there. As we look in Sierra Leone now, cluster Three is the only one that is still around. Um, and there's new mutations, hundreds of new mutations on, on the backbone of that. And so we see that whether this is drift or evolution, you know, it's, it's some sort of evolution is happening, but it could just be driven by uh, neutral processes or it could be driven by adaptation, we don't know. Um, but we do see that the viral population is changing. Um, and, uh, and we see in other places as people are beginning to, we're getting hints of other people's data, it does appear that these early clusters have disappeared for whatever reason, and now these cluster two and three are the only ones staying. We also see that if you look over here on the uh, right-hand side, that we can trace um, how these different clusters are um, uh, tracking geographically, and we can see they're very, very strong correlation with geography. Um, when we look more closely at the data here, oops, this is just a story of a transmission event. We just wanted to show one single transmission event that we could trace with the data because we had this single mutation that emerged and then became more prevalent. And we can see that healthcare worker B um, and, health, and this driver both had that single, uh, these lines are just indicating an intra-host variant. And then it soon basically began to infect many, many people over time. And over here on the right-hand side, we see that um, when that driver drove to Jawi, this explosion happened of cases there. And that's, that, that's sort of the story of this. 
Thank you. And there's some uh, follow-up questions from the same person on this same slide. Um, let's see. So it's two parts. What is What are the mutations that define these clusters, for example, in what genes of the virus? Sure. Um, so that's you can just see that here. This is a blow up, but um, there are uh, so there there are basically if you see cluster one, there's one, two, three, four, five, six mutations that separate it from the Guinean strains that were circulating. So that's six kind of common mutations. There's a lot of other ones you can see these brown ones that are at lower prevalence. But these six mutations sort of define the split between. Um, Guinea, and then you see one, the blue ones, the darker blue ones, one, two, three, four mutations that separate cluster two from cluster one, and then this single mutation uh, that separate cluster three from cluster two. So we're most interested in these five mutations that separate cluster two and three from cluster one because we see that cluster one has disappeared and these five other mutations have emerged. Um, and we see them in different um, spaces. So we, uh, if you look up here, you can see that this gray suggests that it's in an, this particular cluster three mutation is in an, is a is a non-genic region of the genome. But that you see some of these other mutations that are happening in the polymerase here, um, over here in this GP protein. So we're interested in these, the NP protein, so these the glycoprotein. So we're seeing some of them that are an amino acid. Um, that most definitely can have my chance, particularly as this population expands very quickly. Um, uh, it may just be having lots of small mutations that are percolating, but um, that may get cleared out later. But of course, when you're talking with a global outbreak, I am always say, I always say, leave no stone unturned. We really should have every, you know, 100 different labs working, or there are 14 different biosafety level four labs in the United States. All 14 of them should be testing everything they can. Thank you. We have a couple of additional questions. Um, what is the size of the Ebola genome, for example, a number of nucleotides? How long does it take to sequence with the available resources? Sure. So um, the Ebola genome is 19,000 base pairs. Um, so it's a very small genome. It's, 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 uh, it's one segment, so it's not like multiple pieces like some other viruses. It's one 19,000 base segment with these seven genes. Um, and we can sequence this very rapidly. So we showed you that within 10 days we sequenced um, uh, these genomes with three different technologies and testing lots of different things out. But we're really down to if you give us a sample, if we give us a single sample, we would just turn it around to the library construction one day, put it on the machine, and have the data back in 24 hours. But when we're trying to do, uh, we, we're kind of at a, the point where we can do 100 samples a week. Uh, but we want to get more than that as well. Great. Um... Is Ebola considered a rapidly mutating virus? Will today's therapeutics be effective, say, five years from now? So Ebola is, um, it, viruses in general are rapidly mutating. And RNA viruses, which is something that Ebola is, are considered rapidly mutating. Because when you have sort of double-stranded DNA, you don't get a lot of mutations that happen, or they, can, they have a good sort of error-checking function, whereas RNA viruses can have more mutations. It's not you know, extreme. The amount of diversity that we see in Ebola is not extreme. We see much higher, much higher diversity in, say, Lassa virus, um, where we see about 27% nucleotide diversity. Ebola does not have that much, but it does mutate uh, relatively quickly with a mutation rate, a predicted mutation rate of around 8 times 10 to the minus 4 or 10 to the minus 3, which means sort of a mutation every 1,000 bases, um, you know, from individual to individual. So that's, that's something we should all be concerned about. All right. Here's another question. What what are um, what are the susceptibilities of different mutations to drug therapy? Um, well, so that's a that's a great question. Um, you know, so how does basically how do different mutations affect drug therapies? Well, you know, the drug therapies that have been sort of most noted and successful within this outbreak are uh, the the uh, monoclonal antibodies or the sort of pot, uh, uh, or those sort of multiple monoclonal antibodies that have been developed. That what those things do. Let me just kind of move to the right slide. Is here's a picture of it, and here is the sort of antibodies. This is the glycoprotein, which is expressed on the surface of Ebola virus, um, and the monoclonal antibodies are binding to those glycoproteins. If you have a mutation within uh, one of the binding sites of a monoclonal antibody, that antibody may no longer bind. It may no longer be effective. 
And so that's a major issue. Um, and we see in non-human primate studies that we've done for loss of virus, um, and as well as um, clinical samples that we've done, that we begin to see that these GP um, proteins are more likely to change. Um, because the virus, you know, whether it's a therapy or not, just our immune system, our immune system is also developing antibodies, is these glycoproteins know that they need to be able to be changing to be able to evade immune system, as well as the drugs we develop. And so uh, we know that others have done in, in studies, and it does appear that these drugs, as they are introduced, will drive resistance through mutations in GP. But in general, of course, we need to be concerned by our microbes uh, have an incredible sort of will to survive and will mutate um, to protect themselves from the therapies that we have, which is why we need to always stay on top of them. Well, thank you. Um, I'm going to uh, invite uh, Dr. Kuo to rejoin us. Um, I have one more question, but I'd like to invite you to, to come back in in a moment, yep, Winston. I'm here. I'm Hi. Here. <laughs> Here's another question. Is it possible to select for single-chain variants from recombinant antibody libraries if traditional monoclonal antibodies fail? Yeah, um, that is a, that's a place in which there's a, there's a lot, a lot of activity right now in trying to understand the immune repertoire, uh, the response immune system to uh, uh, viruses like Ebola and Lassa, and to use that in order to develop more complex therapies and polyclonal antibodies. And so that's, that's an area of, of intense investigation right now. There's one more here. Uh, which do you foresee, antibody therapies or a vaccine, DNA or other, as a better long-term therapeutic approach? Um, well, I think that both of them are going to be interesting. I mean, the um, antibodies will have to become, you know, move away from monoclonal and be more polyclonal in order to be effective. Um, but obviously, the, I mean, the, the value of a, something like a vaccine or a polyclonal antibody is you're targeting many things. And so as long as you're targeting many things, um, there is the hope that uh, the virus will be able to mutate one thing or two things, but it won't mutate a lot. So this is all this, this sort of safety in numbers or the power of um, combinatorics that's important. So I so it could be either. Um, obviously, people vaccines are great because it's prevention rather than treatment, um, and wherever we can move to that, that's great. Um, uh, but I think that they're both going to be really important and things we should be paying attention to. Great. Well, that's uh, all the questions we have so far, but please feel free to ask more. But I want to say that we have several thank yous coming back. You've done, uh, people are very interested in what you have to say. So thank you so yeah. much. Great. Wonderful. Uh, yeah, Pardis, yeah, no, thank you so much. This is, this is, this is very informative. Um, yeah, I had some similar questions in reference to the mutations. I know that the number of mutations for Ebola is probably about the same as uh, previous outbreaks, and you did mention, and I think I read something about that the Ebola had, uh, had over 350 mutations, and one of my questions was just that, uh, how, and how do we manage based on uh, learning from the Ebola experience uh, future epidemics in which, you know, virus can accumulate very uh, various degrees of mutations in the region of its genome, and as it pertains to our diagnostic tests and therapeutics. <clears throat> You know, I mean, I think the biggest thing we can learn and why I'm sort of, you know, really pushing this is that we, I mean, we still are not doing things as rapidly as we could be doing it, as coordinated as we could be doing things. And so I think that very, very seriously for the next outbreak that could happen, we need to think about how to coordinate much more quickly and how, how to collaborate really right. with open data sharing. I've seen some amazing positive stories and some amazing negative stories. I've seen kind of all sides of the coin of people reaching out from every corner to help and and then individuals who are like chaos and confusion that gets created. But in the end of the day, we haven't moved quickly enough and coordinated enough to get that information out and to implement it in a coordinated fashion. And so I think that the what's really exciting about this is that it's possible. It's possible to get data out immediately um, and, you know, and, and share it with the world and work together coordinatedly and the technology is at the point where we can really do this. Um, but really this is now a huge um, sort of uh, very different sort of political or social or you know, just cultural change, which is right. uh, getting it so that we work together. And I often say that when it comes to viruses, it's actually a place where it's like one of the most powerful, empowering human experiences because it's us against this other outside force, right? So nothing kind of creates bonds like an outside 
you know, agent. Um, and I think that this is a place where we could all come together and say, you know, viruses have no hope if we work together, if we coordinate in a well way. <laughs> where they benefit is where we start to, you know, go to the grocery store and punch each other in the face and like, you know, right. that's actually like how you could infect somebody, right? You, uh, but if we just sort of say, we're partners, here we are, this is how we're doing this, they, 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 they rely on us, you know, to create that confusion in order to succeed. And so I think we can beat this virus by working together and that's, I'm deeply, deeply passionate about that. Yeah. So, so that leads to my second question. Um, you know, as the as the Ebola outbreak by wane and go away, um, you know, we're still going to have other infectious out, outbreaks at some point. And you know, um, and we know that the virus is hides in the nature. You know, it's actually like in small animals that we learn, but it still can be a, f a threat for humans in the future. And based on the global efforts of the Ebola, as you mentioned, uh, the the new development of the CDC, the World Health Organization, I think that your research and and I think not only the research that you have discussed, uh, you actually provided a great framework so that we sort of can uh, better be, be prepared in the future. And are, are there, are, I mean, I, I guess with the new CDC and the, new, and the World Health Organization, are there, I, I mean, um, are there innovative ways in which we can sort of culminate together? Uh, you know, you know how we have the geo or the next-gen sequencing data placed together. Is there something that's focused yep. on this in this area? Yeah, I mean, one of the things I don't want to do is reinvent the wheel, and, and organizations right. like GISAID, which is sort of the, um, who d develops a, a consortium for influenza, um, have been incredible about developing really good resources. I think what we do, what we need to do is support those resources and make it more viable. One of the things is influenza is actually a place where relatively there's more collaboration because influenza comes around year after year, and it's a stable community, and, um, and unless swine flu pops up or something totally different, there's not as much um, dr uh, drama to it, right? And so it actually allows people to be more collaborative. Things like where I've seen or heard stories of non-collaboration, it's places where swine flu emerges or MERS emerges, a totally new outbreak, and there's like a kind of a race to who, who can, you know, get the, whatever, the name and lights and all that kind of stuff. And so I right. think that that's that's an issue and that's something we need to, need to all deal with and say we all succeed if we do it together you know and there's plenty of room on the billboard if everyone does it successfully and I think that um, but I do think that those organizations like GISAID have done an amazing job we just need to support their efforts uh, and double down and and also like we as a community um, particularly those that are developing vaccines and therapies you should demand this information right this right. is important for what you're doing and and I think collectively, we can, as as a global community, we can say like we all deserve better. Um, this is not a place for for um, confusion. And and the the last thing I have, um, no, thank you, uh, is that uh, there are a lot of small companies, biotech companies, uh, that are starting up, uh, whether it's diagnostics or working on therapeutics. How 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 do they? Um, um, because they're they they don't either have the funds or the connections. How do they get involved um, into this? To, or to get access to samples or start to collaborate with people like yourself? You know, I, I think that's a big question, and that's something I'm going to be focused in, in over the next year, which is this idea of how do we get in, how do we, well, I mean, a simple, to start with, we, we just need transparency. I, uh, to be honest, I've actually kind of raised some questions. I don't mean to be like a troublemaker, but I actually, there's $5 billion that's been appropriated, and I have no idea where the money went, and I, I, I just look online and look for <laughs> calls, and I don't see any, so that's a that's a major issue, right? Um, you know, there's, I need to, there needs to be something that says, where does the money go? Who gets it? Why do they get it? Right? I mean, right. this is, this is an urgent, but it's not so urgent that they can't actually put out calls that are, ex that are explicit, and I think we could do better with that. Um, so I think that transparency, transparency, anything where it's sort of like light being shined on something is, is makes things more, you know, worrisome, it means that there's something wrong in the system. And so I, we should know exactly who's getting it and exactly what process, because there's a lot of groups like mine who are looking to get funding who have no idea where to go for it. Apologize, it's my calendar popping up if you hit my screen. <laughs> Um, and so uh, it's, it's, it's an ugly looking calendar. Um, but uh, yeah, so I think that um, uh, so I think that that's the kind of question which is transparency, transparency. We, we need to get all these organizations able to compete in an open market. Right. Um, but more and also um, on that other front, there's also needs to be incentives. We, I understand that actually 
what you know there could have been an incentive for me to keep my data I mean right it wasn't that I could have kept the data I could have not shared it with anybody apparently no data was going to come out for another eight months I could have had a monopoly I could have developed diagnostics that were right. you know the most sensitive and nobody else would have had a chance um, and I could have made a lot of money that way right now right. I just happen to be someone who's not f focused there but I understand that it's also not great when you you know if you you are open source and other people patent and things like that so how do we actually create an environment where That's let's say individuals who contribute the data get something back or coordinate or this right I'm there's some way of making sure that uh, yeah, it wouldn't win that, for everybody. that it's basically yes. balanced yes yeah, a win for everybody, and I think in every way that that's somewhere where we need to spend some good time bringing in the partners, figuring out what everybody's, you know, what everyone needs to succeed, and figure out how to make sure that it works for everybody. And I think that that's going to require a little bit of time and thinking to do it just right, but it's worth doing. Yeah, especially if this is a global effort, you know, it's very hard for, for example, U.S. companies, they don't know where to go. Do they go to people in Africa to do this? Do they go to people in U.S.? And there's certain guidelines. There's many different guidelines and policies, especially working with something like, like the Ebola virus. So there's a, and there's a process. Everything's a process. And there's not nothing out there that stays the process in terms of how you sort of engage to the, to the point where you actually can generate some data. <clears throat> yeah. I, you know, Winston, I would argue that I don't think that the process – and again, I, so there's no individual group that I actually want to ever blame in this situation, and I'm I'm always wanting to say it's not any individual or any person. Yeah, of course. It, it's just a it's a more of a it's a but it's a more global problem. I don't think that I think that the what I noticed in the outbreak is that there is not a lot of clear process. Um, there are some processes, but then as soon as you look, you don't know what the process is. Uh, we ended up basically <laughs> getting stuck because we had been we had spent the last six years um, doing. Um, our safety protocols one way, and then when this came out, they said, "Oh, well, that doesn't work." And even though we had approvals from like five different agencies, it suddenly oh, really? wasn't. So, that, so we can do much better, right? We can do much, right. much better across every. And that's just one example, but it's um, I, there, there's a lot of cooks in the kitchen. There's a lot of people in play, and we don't have a singular global process. Uh, you know, as long as you have a process, you, I always tell people, if you tell me that I have one thing I need to do and I have to write 150 pages, I'm, I'm happy to do it. Where I get stuck is with the confusion of, wait, what am I supposed to do and where do I deliver and who do I disclose to? And this, right. is, the, this is the place where I got hundreds of emails from people across the outbreak all asking me for answers, you know, and because everyone was looking for somebody to tell them how to proceed. And how I to think do it, yes. That is the big thing we need to work on. Yeah, so I, I wish I knew the process. Like, the process would be fine if there was one, but I don't right. know if there is a global right. process across all of these organizations to move as quickly as we truly need to move if there is a deadly outbreak, um, you know, in the future. Yeah, no, th th thank you, Pardis. Well, this is terrific. As, uh, uh, Dr. Quo, would you like to say any concluding messages as we... Draw to a no, close here. No, I, I know. I think I know. I just want to thank uh, Dr. Pardee Sabidi um, and the great questions that were out there. And I think that there's a, a, a lot of things that we learned from her in reference to open source, open source data, uh, especially in outbreaks like this. There's a lot of opportunities, both from the academic side and from the from the industry side. And there has to be, as 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 Dr. Pardee said, that uh, there are no clear processes. Um, so so we sort of have to work together to uh, as a community effort to be able to make things happen in the future. Well, thank you. And Dr. Spade, is there anything, final notes that you'd like to make before we part today? Just, well, thank you for everybody out there who, who are working really hard in this space, developing vaccines, therapies, um, all sorts of, you know, working in this in, in pharma, trying to advance uh, the state of medical health. So um, I really appreciate it and uh, excited to continue to collaborate with you all in the future. Well, and thank you. So um, on behalf of the Biopharma Research Council, I want to thank everyone who's involved today. And um, this is a series that we hold occasionally. And if you have thoughts about the next uh, topic you think would be interesting, I kind of wrote a question with a question mark. I wrote clearing house with a question mark down. You know, is it worth it to have a, a look at the different partners that are working together as well as possible in order to maybe formalize some of those processes for the next outbreak? because we know there will be one. Um, thank you, everyone. Please keep in touch. That's my our website on the screen there. That's my telephone number directly if you'd like to call with any thoughts, questions, comments, if you're interested in participating in future programs, if you'd like to do a presentation. We'd love to hear from you. Thank you, everyone, and we'll see you next time.
Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.